I am with David Schneider from NYU. Yep. He's assistant. <laughs> I'm just gonna <laughs> let you do it. You just yeah. say it. <laughs> hey everyone. I'm uh, David Schneider. I'm an assistant professor at New York University in the Center for Neural Science. Awesome. Yeah, Center. two words, neural science. Neural science. Yeah. And I'm Matt Taylor, again from Nementa. Thanks uh, and welcome <laughs> back to another episode of Interview with the Neuroscience. I'm excited to have Dr. Schneider here because you're the first person who has some uh, auditory expertise. Cool, and I, cool. I think that's really interesting. I've talked to you know Dr. Barry who had retina expertise and mm -hmm. um, that was an interesting conversation. Yeah. But before I, I go to the cards, let me ask you, why do you study the brain? Hmm. Why do I study the brain? I'm really motivated to understand how we as individuals, we as people, but also animals, which is the, the things we actually study, most of us at least, how we perform, how we get around in this world that we live in and how we learn enough about the world so that we can interact with it, mm -hmm. move through it, and, and perform all of the, what I think are really amazing behaviors that we do all the time. So things like me talking right now. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty spectacular behavior that I'm doing right it now. It is. I'm moving my muscles in a really uh, in a really complex way. I've got this fine control over it and I'm doing it in a way so that I can communicate some social information to you and, yeah. to, the, and to the rest of the world out there. Yeah. And that whole motor plan that's controlling my speech right now is controlled by my brain. Yeah. But it goes above and beyond that is that I'm actually controlling with my brain, not just speech, but the social, the social interaction that speech is allowing us to have right now. Yeah. So for me, I study the brain because it's, it's the root of what allows us to do all these amazing things like talk, walk, and have social interactions. So you're, you're trying to look at it from the big picture too, from not just the brain as an organism, <laughs> but as the brain as a component in a larger society of organisms. That's, that's true. That's, I mean, if you wanted to ask why am I motivated to study the brain, that's exactly what it is. I think that, uh, you know, I, I got started in studying the brain by studying uh, songbirds, yeah. who are uh, birds that communicate verbally with one another, or, or vocally, I should say, with one another, mm -hmm. much like you and I communicate verbally, and they do it to transmit social information. And so for me, really, at the very beginning of when I got interested in neuroscience, it was um, studying really the, the basis of how the brain orchestrates social interactions amongst organisms. So I think right. part of it is that that's, that's what got me hooked in the first place. And so although the day-to-day -day science that I don't do is not uh, looking at that big picture, um, I kind of one of the philosophies that I have in science is that we should always be thinking big about how we're going to fit the experiments that we do into, yeah. the, the, into neuroscience as a whole, but we, we execute small. Well, it's hard to execute large-scale neuroscience exactly. Exactly. experiments ethically. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, let's get to the cards then, because you've already touched on something I want to talk about. Okay. Cool. So, okay, so I got some nice drawings for you this perfect, time. Perfect. That's First great. bird song, we've already talked about bird song, so I'm interested in that. That would be a cool topic great, of conversation. Great. Okay, this one is tricky. This, oh no, this one's not the tricky one. Okay, uh, maybe it is. It, it might maybe be tricky. Maybe not, well, yeah, fine. Well, one of these is actually like a Pictionary game. I want you, to, we, we gotta try and guess the caption. All right, what's the topic for this picture? What is the topic for this picture? What is we've got this? something. Yeah. Slide, okay, one of a thousand. Okay, that's. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. just a little hint. But what is this and what is this? Yeah. Okay. There's a projector. Projector over here. Projector. That's projecting onto a screen a picture of, of a. a I'm, I'm going to be really bad at this now. I should know what that's a picture of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was. It's my own drawing. It's a. It's a motor. Okay. That's what I was going to say. A motor. I was yeah. going to say an engine. Okay. It's yeah. a motor. It's a, pro a projecting. Okay. I, I want to talk about motor projections. Beautiful. I'm sorry. I mean, Loader it's a, projection. It's a stretch. I love it. I, I have That's to great. try at each one of these That's to do great. some awful pun. Yeah. Okay, anyway, waste enough time on that. And then the space of sound or sound space. Awesome. I think that's an interesting one. So Cool. Um, what order would you like to go in here? Why don't you pick? Well, let's see. Okay. So, boy, let's, well, okay, let's hold off on this one for a little bit. Okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, we'll get into that via this one. 
Should we just start? Yeah, with that's what we've what already we, been talking we, about. Let's do it. Um, should I hold on to these? Yeah, you can put them down or okay, fantastic. Whatever, whatever right you here. like. But okay. Uh, anyway, my main, my main question is why? What's interesting about bird songs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's interesting about bird songs? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, songbirds are interesting because they're one of the few clads of animals, the groups of animals that, like humans, learn the complex vocalizations that they use to communicate with one another. So a lot of animals vocalize. Yeah. Dogs vocalize, cats vocalize, squirrels vocalize, mice vocalize. Other primate species, non-human primates vocalize. But they don't learn those vocalizations. They can produce those without having a tutor or a model mm. who they want to emulate. It's not a social learning, it's not passed down. That's right. So. I, I should say that that's maybe a, a bit of an antiquated view. I think there is evidence that social experience can modulate vocalizations. Sure. Existing vocalizations. <coughs> Exist, right. but, but the the really kind of starting from scratch and learning from your parent or from a tutor right. how to vocalize right. is something that's extremely rare in the animal world. Yeah. Um, and so songbirds have become a model for studying the neural biological basis of how an organism can listen to a tutor and learn how to reproduce a complex vocalization that that their tutor produced. Right. Um, but birds don't. Uh, they they can vocalize aside from songs, right? They, uh, that's right. And so they have non-learned vocalizations as well. That's right. So they have vocalizations that are innate, that they're that even in the absence of any tutor, that they'll they'll produce. Right. They have alarm calls. They have all sorts of of calls that they make. Um, the 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 chicks have begging calls mm -hmm. that um, tell their tell their parents that it's time to eat. Yeah, um, like a lot of mammals have that type of stuff yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Usually, the specific vocalizations that are learned are the vocalizations that are used in adulthood to court. Courting songs. Yes. Yeah, so to to, uh -huh. to woo. Ah, it the, all uh, makes the sense opposite now. Sex. <laughs> exactly. So and and you know it's interesting because birds are often prey. Mm -hmm. for other animals out in the wild. It's interesting that birds would have evolved to learn and sing these loud, elaborate songs because what are you doing? You're advertising yourself <laughs> to right. the predators out there that might want to eat you. It must be worth it. <laughs> but at the same time, you're advertising, advertising yourself to potential mates. Yeah. And the idea yeah. is that the, the complexity of your song as a songbird and the quality of your song can be indicative of your uh, genetic you know, prowess. And the mate is some type of qualitative judge of the song. The mate is the judge of the song. Amazing. And so, so I think there's some some ideas out there that the mate, this usually, so usually it's the, the male that sings. Yeah. And it's the female that's judging the male song. It's not, in not every species, but in, in the species that we typically study in the lab, which is the zebra finch, mm -hmm. um, only males sing. And the idea is that females might actually be learning something about song during their adolescence. They're not learning how to sing, but they might be forming a template of their father's song. Oh. The idea being that if their father gave birth to them, yeah. he must have been an adequate male. Right. And uh. so if they want to find themselves a partner who's going to be capable of producing offspring, right. maybe they should try to find their dad. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> you know, amazing. It's a little Freudian. Yeah, but, it's, uh, but, it, but it makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, evolutionarily, it totally makes sense. So, yeah. It reminds me of bower birds and yeah. the behaviors of, of creating these really elaborate physical structures. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, I think birds, there's a lot of ways in which birds really uh, woo one another. Yeah. And song is one of them and uh, building physical structures. I mean, the animal world is filled with this. Yeah. Um, songs, I mean, it's so it's building physical structures, it's mm -hmm. singing, but also the, the elaborations of the plumage. And the dancing. You know, the dancing, yeah, the plumage, yeah. the, all of these different things. Uh, but it all involves motor, all of it. It has to. It does, yeah. right? Um, and and so, so the vocalizations, the reason why I think of all of those behaviors, bird song, as a, the, the reason why there's in the field of neuro neurobiology a field of bird song mm -hmm. and not um, bird dancing Dance. <laughs> or bird building yeah, is yeah. that the bird the song itself has this really has a few really beautiful qualities to it yeah so one is that it has this complexity to it that is fairly reminiscent of human speech mm -hmm. it has this spectrotemporal complexity to mm -hmm. it that 
um, if you were to look at like a, uh, a visualization of a song, which is something called, you know, we call a sonogram, which shows kind of the frequency contents of a song as they're varying over time. Mm -hmm. And if you were to, to show that on top of or, or next to uh, a sonogram of human speech, you would see that they both kind of have these same kind of characteristic signatures of their complexity. Yeah. Like the meter timber of totally the the rate at which individual they si birds sing syllables or uh -huh. notes that are uh, come out at a rate that's roughly similar to the rate at which I'm spitting out words mm. and yeah. so so it's so one thing that's that's nice about song is that it's this really complex behavior. Right. The other thing is that it's in in many species at least, including the zebra finch, which we often study in the laboratory, it's extremely stereotyped. So the bird will sing the exact same song over and over and over again. And if you're a neuroscientist, what you often want to be able to do is to study the brain, but not just study it. You, don't, you want to maybe monitor what the brain is doing, but you want the animal to do the same thing over and over and over again so that you can monitor different parts of the brain. Mm. But um, we would call this a behavior clamp experiment. The behavior is clamped. It's so stable that you can go and study the brain at different parts at different times. Uh -huh. um, but you can then compare their activities, even though you weren't recording from neurons, let's say, simultaneously. Right. You can record from neuron one right. during one rendition of the song, neuron two during another rendition of the song. But the song is so stable yeah. that you can assume that even though you weren't recording from neuron two when you were recording from neuron one, that it was probably doing the same thing hmm. because the behavior is so stable um, and the neural representation of these behaviors is so stable, it, allow, it gives you this opportunity to really study how the brain produces song in a, in a really cool way. Does the song become stable over time? Like, yeah, it does. Yeah. So songbirds like the zebra finch go through a period of, of, of maturation into adulthood that lasts about 100 days or so. Mm -hmm. So be from the time they hatch until they're 100 days old, that's when they become uh, adults. and. Um, during that time of about 100 days is when their song is maturing. And mm. so this is where it has another interesting parallel to human speech is that when a bird is born, it can vocalize, but it can't sing. It has this very rudimentary kind of babbling. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the, the male babies will listen to their dad sing. They right. listen, they listen, they listen. Right. They don't sing themselves, they just listen. Right. And they can do that, maybe they'll do that for a month or so. Then you can take the dad away and the bird never hears his dad again, but he's formed a memory in his head of what his dad mm -hmm. has sung. And then over the course of the next month, he's gonna start practicing. And at first he's gonna be really bad. He's gonna just babble something really terrible. Yeah. But some parts are gonna be similar enough to his dad's song that they're gonna match. And he's gonna slowly and slowly make his song better and better and better until uh, by the time he's 80 or 90 days old, his song sounds just like that memory he had of his wow. dad's song. Really? So it's really cool. And so we have this really, amazing behavior that's that's beautiful and complex during adulthood yeah. but also has this really awesome maturation from uh, childhood to adulthood right. in a way that also is reminiscent of of the way that humans learn how to speak right yeah. that yeah. if you have children you know that they they start by they listen to us and then they start repeating words. Sometimes they repeat words we don't want them to repeat. <laughs> um, but luckily at first they often don't quite sound right, but we know what they're saying. But then yeah. eventually they get better and better and they start to really have this amazing verbal capacity. So, that's, so it's um, a learned complex behavior. That's, a, that's why it's interesting. So uh, that's, I would say those are the reasons why it's interesting. Yeah. Then there's another reason for why we like studying it as neuroscientists. The bird brain has structures in it called nuclei mm -hmm. that are devoted to song and only song. Oh, so wow. song is one of the, is a, is a motor action. It's a motor behavior that a bird makes, but birds make lots of other motor behaviors, right? They fly, yeah. they walk, they, they, they do other vocalizations, mm -hmm. they eat, they, they do tons of things. But they have these nuclei in their brain that are dedicated to doing song and song only. Right. Um, if you remove these nuclei from the bird's brain, if you lesion them, they can't sing, but yeah. they can do everything else that they've ever done. Wow. <laughs> um, and so that's really neat because it gives you the capacity now to study the bird brain yeah. and to know exactly what parts of the brain you want to study yeah. um, and to know that if, you s if you're studying those parts of the brain that what those neurons are doing in that part of the brain are dedicated to this one single behavior. So it's isolation. It's yeah. isolation. It's, it's, a w it's, a, it's a level of isolation that we don't have in other organisms that we typically study. Right. Um, that makes sense. So that's another advantage that we have. Right. Of, of studying the songbird. One of the disadvantages is that the organization of the songbird brain, it, it doesn't have a clear structure that's reminiscent of the human brain, for example, which is this, um, has a neocortex on the top, which mm -hmm. is the where we think is kind of the root of all of the complex behaviors that we have. Um, 
the songbird also has a telencephalon, uh -huh. which we think kind of has the same origin developmentally as the neocortex, but it's organized in a very different way. Rather than having a neocortex, which is this uh, layered structure with these six layers, yeah. the bird brain has these nuclei, which are these kind of, uh, you know, maybe like egg-shaped clusters of neurons that are distributed right. throughout the brain uh -huh. um, that are involved in controlling song, both at the motor end of things, as well as listening to songs on the hearing side of things. In the same nuclei, listening and no, it's, and so motor. it's it's different. It's different nuclei, although there are nuclei that um, seem to have responses to both. So okay. there are there are these really interesting things. This is going to be total caveat here or a total uh, uh, non sequitur here about um, there's these mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are neurons that are active when the bird is engaging in a behavior, like singing. Yeah. But they're also active if the bird is observing somebody else do the exact same behavior. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of kind of theories out there for what mirror neurons are for, but one of the ideas is that those are the neurons that are allow us to learn in the first place because yeah. they can represent both the observation of somebody else making an action, mm -hmm. and that can directly translate into our ability to make that same action. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Michael Berry a bit about mirror neurons cool. too. Yeah. Uh, so we have covered it a bit here. So I won't get into it. I have my own opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's go on to the next topic. Let's do the footsteps ones. Let's I do the footsteps. I think that, that, that'll be a good one to, to move into, okay. which is uh, probably the next one up there. Um, oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that I, I can put, I'm, put, I'm adding sounds. So oh, yeah. you, uh, there's footsteps right there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so what's different? about the sound of your own footsteps versus <coughs> the sound of someone else's footsteps? Yeah, great question. So, you tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Do you notice your own footsteps? So this is, so Hardly I would ever, say, no. So, so that's what, so I think that that's it. I think that footsteps are, are one of these sounds that I think we all, we all make all the time. But most of the time we're unaware that we're making them. Yeah. And sometimes we become really aware of them. So sometimes, for instance, uh, we're on a carpeted floor right now, but there's hardwood out here. And I think if we were to walk out there, the first few steps I made on hardwood, mm -hmm. I would notice because the sounds would be loud relative to the muffled sounds that I'm making on carpet. Right. But if I were to walk down the hall on hardwood floors, uh, I would stop noticing my um, the sound of my own footsteps. Right. And it's not really informing you. It's not really informing <laughs> you. So footsteps are an example of a category of sounds that are self-generated sounds. Mm -hmm. So I think almost every movement that we make generates sounds. So I'm speaking right now and that makes sounds. But I think there's a lot more subtle movements that I make like uh, hitting my hands on this right now, kind of scratching Digiting. on the sides, yeah. fidgeting. Yeah. Uh, my breathing yeah. is making sounds. Yeah. And a large fraction of the sounds that we make with our own body are have two things in common. One is they're very predictable. Well, we're doing because them. Because we're doing them. <laughs> yeah. And they're also completely irrelevant. Yes. And so it behooves us <laughs> right. to take advantage of that predictability uh -huh. to ignore them. So because we're generating the signal for yes. our bodies to move, we've got the signal That's right. to cancel. That's right. Well, for the most part. We yeah. have the signal that causes the sound. And so the question is, can we use it right. to cancel? Right. And so that's what, so the idea is there's a part of my brain, which is the motor the motor parts of my brain, which are the parts that are making me do all the different behaviors that I'm doing. Where, where is the motor yeah. part? Compared? Okay, great. So this is, okay. So the motor part of our brain is um, effectively uh, on the frontal part of the cortex and on the top here is mm -hmm. these are the, the, the main motor regions of our brain. Um, There's like these somatic stripes, you know, that kind of go down like that. That's right, right. Uh, that's right. Sensory input comes in. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, so you've got vision on the back, somatic sensation here, and then motor. Um, in front of that. Okay. Um, and so the motor cortex is sending the signals to my body that are causing me to, to do all the different behaviors that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a lot of other motor regions that are down here underneath that are not cortical as well that are involved in this. Um, but the idea is that when they send a signal down to my muscles to cause me to move, that they can send a copy of that signal. We mm -hmm. call it an efference copy or a corollary discharge. And they can route a copy of that signal to other parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. So in the case of ignoring your own footsteps, we think that they route a copy of that motor signal to uh, the hearing centers of the brain or the auditory cortex in particular. So the auditory cortex, so motor systems are over here and the auditory cortex is located within this, this groove right here called the sylvian fissure. Mm. And so in the temporal lobe. In the temporal lobe. And so it's actually, the primary auditory cortex is actually deep into that that fissure, it goes really, it's I'm not like sure if we can actually open this, this off, up, but yeah. yeah, so if we actually, so it's kind of sitting right at, let's see, let's take the cerebellum. It always falls apart. 
let's put the cerebellum on this uh, plate over here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the auditory cortex is kind of, if we could open that up. Um, yeah. Boom, yeah that's there goes half the brain. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's in there. And um, and it also kind of extends out to the to the, to the edge over here as well, kind of uh, secondary regions of the auditory cortex. It's pretty close to the, what, diencephalon, is that what that's called? Yeah. This yep. thing. Yep, yep, <laughs> exactly. And, um, okay, we'll just, we'll yep. just stack it. Just <laughs> toss it over here. Okay, um, <laughs> so, okay, so the idea is I make an action. The motor cortex sends an efferent copy of that signal over to the auditory cortex. Mm -hmm. And the auditory cortex can then use that if it decides to, 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 uh, to cancel out the sounds of, that are going to be generated by the movement that I just executed. But in order to do that, it, ha it's, it has to know what sound is going to occur. It does. That's right. Uh, and it doesn't know that information from the motor command. That's right. So the idea is the motor command is simply sending over to the auditory cortex the movement that I'm making. It's the auditory cortex's job to, um, to, to recognize and keep, effectively keep a tally. Of, yeah. Hey, okay, the last time I made that movement, mm -hmm. here's the sound that accompanied it. And the time before, here's the sound that accompanied so it. So it's got to be doing you know, some sequence <coughs> memory of that's right. I, I, time. I, I think of it as it's doing some sort of statistical learning, that it's yeah. learning the statistical relationship yeah. between a movement that I make yeah. and within some short delay thereafter, right. the sounds that hit my ear. Yes. That because makes sense. Um, the idea being that I'm going to make a movement and there's going to be sounds that hit my ear. But those aren't all going to be generated by the movement. Sometimes you're going to be talking. Sometimes, sometimes there's going to be a cat meowing. Sometimes there's going to be a, 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 you know, a fire alarm going off. I don't know. Elephants. And elephants. <laughs> like most of the time, elephants. But the idea is that uh, at the core of that is there's one component that's constant across that, which is the sound that the footsteps make. Yes. And if you average over enough of those, the other stuff gets washed out. And what's left yeah. is just the footsteps. And sound. you've heard enough footsteps in your life. You, you should have. be able to cancel them out in whatever medium you happen to be walking on. That's right. So I think that there's kind of two components of it. One is like you can comp you can pay attention to the last few footsteps you made because as, as I transition from walking on carpet to walking on hardwood, I have a very quick change in the sound that my footsteps make. Yeah. Um, and the brain can probably learn very quickly by just getting a few exemplars of that, mm -hmm. what sound to cancel out. Sure. Um, but I think there's probably also a, a bit of a longer term memory that I've walked on hardwood enough times and yeah. I've walked on carpet and gravel and, and dry leaves enough times. You've walked on so many things. If you see something, you don't quite know what it is, you probably know what it's going to sound like. You can make a pretty good guess. Yeah. Um, and so even before you get on there, you probably have an anticipation. Even before that, you set the, your first foot down on that new surface. Right. You probably have an anticipation of what the sound is going to be. So this makes me question, does this mean that if I were to have like a clicker in my hand and I put it by my ear and I clicked it and then someone else put it in the same spot and clicked it that I would hear the second one louder? <coughs> yeah, great question. So I think it would. It seems like it would. I would make I would make the prediction that you would. Yeah. Now, I think this this mechanism will break down at some point. Now, a clicker held right up to your ear, it's going to drive you batty yeah. whether you're doing it yeah. or whether I'm doing it. Um, but there's actually been experiments in humans and in animal models to show that when a sound is generated by a person's own action, even if it's just like pushing on a little button that mm -hmm. creates a, a sound, that those sounds are perceived to be quieter than if that sound was generated by somebody else. Right. So, um, Which is good evolutionarily. I mean, that's what you would want, I would think. It really is. I think that's what you want. So the idea is like, you know, let's think evolutionarily. I'm a caveman and I'm walking, not in a cave, but I'm walking through a forest, right? And mm -hmm. I'm stepping on twigs and I'm cracking sticks and stepping on leaves. But I don't really want to notice those sounds. But what I really want to notice is if that same sound happens at a time when I'm not stepping. Yeah. So yeah. an interesting thing about ignoring, ignoring your own footsteps is that you have to know what your footstep sounds like, mm -hmm. but you can't be constantly ignoring that sound. Right. You have to be ignoring it really at the precise time when you yeah. expect it to happen. And then when you're not in between your steps, yeah. you want to be open to it. This is not a blurry filter. It's not a blurry this filter. It's very precise be, exactly. uh, tuning. Um, so I, uh, this, is, this is effectively what I study in my work, but mm -hmm. I'll say that you know, I don't study it because I care fundamentally about how the brain ignores our own footsteps. Right. I think that the capacity to, your, to ignore your own footsteps um, is representative of what I think is some very core computations that the brain has to perform for other, maybe even more useful things that the brain does. Mm. So 
if you can ignore your own footsteps, it tells you it tells you that you've been able to segregate in your brain the sounds that your own body made versus sounds that are coming from the environment. So, mm -hmm. you know, everything we hear has to come in through these two little holes that are like pencil sized, right? right? Pencil diameter sized. And they, so they all get funneled together, whether it's the sounds I'm making or the sounds you're making. Yeah. And they all get funneled together through to a single same place. Space. Yep. Yeah. And it's up to our brain to detangle them. Yeah. And if you can ignore your own footsteps while pay, while still maintaining sensitivity to Big others, win. <laughs> it proves that the brain has the capacity to do this detangling. Yeah. And that's something that comes in handy even when it's not your own footsteps. It comes in handy for um, when I'm learning how to speak, for example, I'm not mm -hmm. every, I'm not doing it in a vacuum where I'm the only one making noises. So when I'm talking and the dog is barking and the baby's crying, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to get better and better, I need to know which of those sounds that I heard simultaneously with my utter my vocalizations were actually my utterances, mm -hmm. and which were the things that that weren't. Really. And um, if you're trying to learn how to play a musical instrument, to speak a new language, the capacity to be able to to tease apart the sounds that get funneled into our ear that were generated by myself versus somebody else is, is it's a big win. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost essential. It's, ex I think it is essential. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's go into the next All right. topic. Uh, do, let's okay. do the motor uh, okay. projections. I'm going to bring You're just talking about more how motor projects to the auditory cortex. But the reason I wanted to talk about this because I have a feeling motor projects a lot of places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So motor, this is, this is a beautiful card. I hope that this gets, <laughs> Kept in some special place. You can have it. Place. You can take it with you. I, I will. I'll take you up on that because it's right. fantastic. Great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about yeah, the motor cortex sending signals into the auditory cortex, right? right? The motor cortex isn't just sending signals into the auditory cortex. It's the, I think the idea of motor projections is the idea that um, the motor systems in our brain are sending projections. Uh, they're broadcasting them pretty widely to not just to our hearing centers, but also to the other sensory modalities that we have. Is it for the um, same reason that it's broadcasting to the auditory cortex? In large part. I mean, I th that's one of the reasons why it's being broadcast. So, so that the senses could basically predict what they're about to sense. That's right. Right. That's right. So uh, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's pretty straightforward in hearing that a lot of my movements make sounds and I want to be able to anticipate them. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of other movements that I make that have sensory consequences that aren't acoustic. So, you know, as I put my hand on the chair here, I'm going vibrations to get some too. vibrations. Yeah. I'm going to feel things on my fingers. Yeah. Um, but also, there's going to be this object flying through my visual field of view. <laughs> like, I don't want to think like, oh, God, somebody threw an arm through space. Yeah. It's my arm, you know? Uh, right. Or if I'm, uh, you know, as I'm walking, uh, I'm going to cause some optic flow to come past me. So mm -hmm. if I'm walking at one meter per second down the sidewalk, um, the truth is that what my eyes are seeing is no different than if I was standing still and the world was moving past me at one meter per second. Sure. And I want to know the difference between those two things because yeah. they mean very different things are happening in the world. <laughs> so these motor signals can tell us what, how the world is about to change given the actions that I'm taking in the world right now. Right. And regardless of whether it's hearing or vision or somatic sensation, uh, it really behooves us to be able to have that information. So that the, the, the motor cortex, the part, it does not get speed forward sensory input, does it? So the motor cortex also gets sensory input sent it, back to it. it sent back to well, it? Well, sent to it, sent, sent forward to it. To it. Yeah, from, exactly. from, the sma from all senses or just some? Um, there must be somatic senses. I mean, those are the closest, closely closely tied to. Definitely gets, but it does get uh, direct projections from the auditory cortex as well as from the visual cortex. Interesting. So it does, whether it gets projections from like uh, uh, olfactory cortex, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's getting some sensory input. So, I mean, anytime I think of a cortex getting some sensory yeah. input, I feel like it's modeling. It's, I mean, it's, it's got to be modeling yeah, something. Yeah, so it's not yeah. just generating behavior. It's got to be modeling stuff, too. That's right. right. So, you know, we kind of think about this, there being uh, forward models and inverse models, mm -hmm. where the forward model is the uh, information coming from the motor cortex back to the sensory cortex. But then there's also sensory cortical information being sent to the motor cortex. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the ideas for like, let's say sensory information being sent to the motor cortex in hearing, for example, is uh, the capacity to hear a tune on the piano and then to be able to sit down and immediately play it, for mm -hmm. example. The idea being that the auditory system has sent a mapping into the motor cortex that tells my motor cortex what I need to do to reproduce the sound that I just heard. Right. Um, and they say some, some musicians have this natural ability exactly. to play by ear. You know. To play by ear. And there are animals that have this ability. Now we can talk about birds again, right? There mm. are birds that can hear a sound 
and reproduce it after a single observation. Right. Um, and right. so they really have this capacity to uh, that that it's one would imagine is is being done through these projections from hearing centers directly to the motor centers. Huh. Um, Interesting. So, so the, those types of people who have that ability, they just could, might have better connections between hearing and motor centers. You know, I think that's a, that's a great. I, there have been experiments to look at the, the density of the connectivity between motor and auditory areas in mm -hmm. professional musicians versus amateur musicians. Sure. And using rather coarse, non-invasive strategies like um, uh, uh, MRI. And there's, there is a lot of evidence that the pathways uh, you know, you don't know directionality. Where's the information flowing when right. you look at these? Uh, you know, is it going from motor to auditory or auditory to motor? Yeah. But the 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 um, the bundles, the f the uh, uh, the projections seem to be denser in professional musicians than not. And I, fr I, I I'm pretty sure too that there's evidence that uh, practice makes those projections grow larger. I hope so. So it's not <laughs> just that you're born with it. Yeah. It's that you can actually build it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that makes but sense. I agree. I mean, I think the idea mm -hmm. here is that the idea, you know, we, motor projections, it's not just the motor system that's projecting. It's really every area is broadcasting outputs to every other area. Yeah. And it's, it's those long range projections that are allowing the brain to do, to create internal models of the world. It's to, to allow the brain to model what's going to happen in one area, given what just happened uh, in another area, mm -hmm. or given what just happened in the world one time step prior. Right, um, and it just makes you realize how completely your brain participates in action, or like throwing a ball, how all of your brain comes in, and like the parts of your, your visual cortex, your auditory cortex, your motor cortex, your yeah, somatic, yeah. all of it contributes to that action. Yeah. Because you know, they all know what it feels and say, what it, it sounds like, what it looks it, like. It's totally true, and I think in some ways, you know, just to circle back for a second to the songbird conversation that we had earlier, where I talked about one of the benefits of the songbird being that you have this distinct regions of the brain that are involved in this one behavior. Yeah. And that, that is a really amazing uh, aspect of the songbird for neuroscientists. But in some ways, you have to ask whether that's a very special case, because it seems like in most other brains where responsibilities are more distributed mm -hmm. and information is broadcast more densely all over the place right. that you do have more integrative brain function during these behaviors than right. you do in something like a songbird that's that's singing yeah yeah but but perhaps that's that's good for generalization perhaps absolutely yeah. absolutely i would say so that these are animals that are trying to uh, be adaptable to their environment right and um, you know you wouldn't necessarily want to have a highly specialized structure. Sure. But if, if evolution has pushed the songbird such that song is a strong indicator of fitness, mm -hmm. then it does make sense that yeah. the brain would have evolved those structures to, to benefit it. Right. But, um, yeah. Okay, last topic. Cool. I, I think this one's really interesting. It's the soundscape cool. one. Oh, yeah. Sound let's space. See. Sound space. Let's so see what got here. I think about space and time a lot. Okay. But cool. I don't think about sound and space and time very often. Sure, cool. So the idea of sound representing space, there's two ways to, that I can think about this. First, you can close yeah. your eyes and you can think, oh, I hear something over that direction or I hear something that direction. I can hear things behind me. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can hear someone sneaking up on you, you know, if yeah, you, yeah, if you yeah. focus on it, <coughs> if even if they're being quiet. So that's one uh, location in space. Mm -hmm. But then there's other ways that you might be able to encode space using sound that I'd like you to talk about. Well, what are those other what are those other ways? So I used to play with synthesizers a lot. Okay. So when you talk about soundscapes, yep. you know, I, when you've got this array of knobs, every one is a dimension of yeah, a sound great, great. that you can yeah. make. Okay. Yeah. So I so I would agree. So I think sound is a very high dimensional sensation. So I think about objects a lot, and it's hard for me to relate objects to yeah. sound. That's okay. Totally true. Yeah. Um, I actually tend to think about auditory objects as a thing. Like to me, that's something that that I think comes very natural. Well, I think it but has maybe to be that way. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe, uh, and I'm not sure if it's because I think about it more or because well, enlighten um, me. I'd love we might to have different ideas of what yeah, an object is. I'd love to hear is, your but, take on it. Um, I think the idea. So, so there are some interesting aspects about thinking of objects in the auditory domain as opposed to in the the physical domain, mm -hmm. like by um, Phil's coffee. Uh, Phil's coffee cup here. Um, <laughs> they did not endorse the show, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if they would like to. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it can be static. I could take a snapshot of this object. It's complex. It has some structure to it. It has some components to it. Mm -hmm. But I could take a snapshot of this object, and I could, I could glance at it for just like a few hundred milliseconds, and I could tell you exactly what it was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Auditory objects are a little bit different. Yeah. The sound of my voice, the, the, a word being spoken, um, a chimes, a, a trombone. Auditory objects, by definition, their identity must be uh, uncovered by following them over time. You have to integrate over time. Because it's a wave. Because it's a wave, right? Yeah. Because a, a static auditory object is DC, and mm -hmm. DC causes no, you know, it's nothing. Right, so you ha right. it has to evolve over time. Right. And for a complex, for most objects, most auditory objects, the way we think about an auditory object uh, is, is, has some complexity. And that mm -hmm. complexity is what defines it, and that complexity evolves over time. And that unfolding over time could be short on the order of uh, tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, but right. sometimes it's, you know, if you want to... It could be a tone or a note or a phrase or a exactly, stanza. Or exactly. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is that the scale of time over which you have to listen to a sound in order to get its identity often is longer than the uh, duration with which individual neurons in the auditory system are firing. Oh. And so that tells you that in order to for your auditory system to recognize an auditory object, it requires that you integrate over neurons that have actually stopped firing. The neurons that fire at the beginning of the auditory object are not on, and the ones that are firing at the end are, and they don't uh -huh. necessarily overlap. Yeah. And so it's interesting to think about how does the brain recognize auditory objects. We've kind of gotten away from your initial question here. No, but, but that's okay. Um, I mean, I mean, we're trying. We're kind of warping my idea of space, you know, in this in this idea of object. Well, it's, so I think this, so. One of the ideas here is that in audition, time is, is a dimension it, yes. that, that matters. That matters it's a lot. It's the key dimension. It's the key dimension. Yeah. Right? So you have to have time yeah. in a way that it, for, for uh, visual imagery, time is critical for things like watching a movie. Mm -hmm. But you could have a painting which is static in time and already has complexity to sure. it. But you cannot have that in audition. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's complex. Mm -hmm. um, so you have spatial dimensions in hearing. Um, I can tell where a sound is coming from in the environment. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I, won't go into this too deep unless you want me to. Mm -hmm. We use cues. Um, I, we, I already mentioned earlier that you know we all the sounds get funneled into our ears, but we're lucky enough to have two of them. And so what that means is that a sound coming from the left is going to hit my left ear before it's going to hit my right ear. Right. And our brain can take advantage of that subtle timing difference to calculate the location of the sound as being on the left. Right. Um, there's also um, subtle differences in the intensity of the sound mm -hmm. because it's gonna hit my left ear and by the time it gets around to my right ear, it's dissipated a little bit, the waves are weaker. Mm -hmm. So there's these interaural timing differences and interaural level differences that we can use to compute sounds on the azimuth. We call the, this left, right, you know, where it is along left, right as the azimuth. Right. Um, and we can also compute elevation. Uh -huh. And we compute elevation in a, in a more interesting way, which is that we use, um, spectral cues or the, the how the frequency components change. I think this also involves prediction and expectation in a lot of ways. Yeah. Is that um, your, I know what a, a voice should sound like. I know kind of how its spectral content should be. Right. And if you're speaking from above me versus straight at me versus from below me, uh, my ears and my head will filter those sounds differently. Hmm. So they'll filter out some frequencies, my, my pinna here, the, the outer ears, and I will hear the frequency contact that actually gets into my brain will be slightly different depending on whether the voice came from above, below, or in front of me. And we can use that information to tell where a sound and, and is And it's coming just from. how the waves are kind of angling through your ears and... It's why we have the shapes here. It's, yeah. what, it's what these things are for. I Aside from picking up and funneling <laughs> the sound, they're also there too. And it's interesting to think that we all have different shaped ears, so we all have a slightly different transfer function that we're applying to the sounds uh, in the world. And they all seem to work. I know. It's <laughs> like when you're stoned in your dorm room and you're like, is my blue like your blue? <laughs> but like, maybe my voice is not like your voice. Because I was we all just are... thinking, is color like pitch? Yeah, know? well, that's, well, I think so. I, then you get to the other dimensions here where I think, you know, in some ways I think you could imagine that, that the other dimensions that matter a lot in sound are pitch, and timing, there's some timing dimensions that are not just time, mm -hmm. like tempo, for example, which evolves over time, but is kind of a separate uh, dimension. There's also waveforms, you know, at, at, at lower levels. What type of wave are, is the tone? Uh, exactly. And I don't even know what type of audio uh, acoustic characteristic that is. Is that an? Is it a, is it a saw wave? Is it a sine wave? Is it? Yeah, a, but know? is it is that an object? Is it a feature of an object? Is it is it a feature of a phrase? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> But our brains certainly have the capacity to recognize and encode these things, which is um, pretty amazing. So I think sound space or soundscapes mm -hmm. involves real space in these kind of Cartesian coordinates in which we live, yeah. and as well as 
acoustic features like timbre and pitch, yeah, as well as time, yeah, and that is really those are the those are the dimensions that make the soundscape that we live in and the sound space that we live in, right, and. It's within that sound space, this kind of high dimensional sound space, mm -hmm. that as you and I are talking right now and listening to cars going by, that we are taking sounds in that sound space and, um, and clumping them into objects. Right. So like you're sitting over to my right, your voice has some, some particular frequency components to it, and so in this complex space, you can imagine I'm, I'm kind of projecting your voice into this sound space, yeah. and it's sitting in one location, and and but other I mean, sounds. But it's integrated, right, with the, with the rest of my perception of the space. So the acoustic part is attaching to your idea of me as an object. Right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So there's this binding yeah. component as yeah. well, which is that but it's not I, just a voice; it's my voice. It's your voice. It's attached to me right here. Exactly. So there is this cross modality binding that mm -hmm. um, you know I'm aware that you're there. Uh, in my vision and my addition are acting together to to bind this into a into a single into a single object. Right. And if you, you know, if all of a sudden your lips kept moving and your voice was the same, but the words you were saying didn't jibe with what your lips were doing, I would get terribly confused. Which you're gonna do right now because that's what I just did. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. The beauty of uh, post. I didn't do anything. Post yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, Dr. Schneider, I think I, we had a great interview. Is there anything great. you'd like to, to talk about? Uh, you have a little soapbox here. What's <coughs> really? interesting you oh, wow. at the moment? <laughs> what are you excited uh, about in neuroscience? What am I excited about in neuroscience? You know, I'm excited about what I think, to be, to be perfectly honest, what I'm excited about is what it has been my conversations here for the past 24 hours here at Numenta, which is thinking about the brain and the neocortex in particular as being a, a piece of prediction machinery and thinking that what the cortex has evolved to do is to anticipate the future mm -hmm. and to be able to recognize statistical regularities in the world in order to make those predictions. And I think thinking about that as a core computation of what the cortex is doing is exciting for me because I think it's it gives us an opportunity to, to it gives us a, th a theoretical framework in which we can devise experiments, which is what I do, mm -hmm. and t to to come up with experiments that allow us to to both test that as a theoretical framework, but also to explain our results in a more nuanced theoretical framework. Right. But it also gives us that gives us the chance to interaction with with folks here at Numenta who are working on building computational models with the same things in mind, and I think that that's to me one of the most important things we can do in neuroscience is to have experimentalists who are who are getting their hands dirty and brains and recording neural activity and monitoring neural activity and, and perturbing neural activity um, to interact with people who are thinking at a much more computational level about how the brain ought to be performing things and to keep those bridges going is, is really exciting. Well, we're just thrilled you're here, honestly. Cool. Well, likewise, it's been great. <laughs> it's been cool. a pleasure. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Dr. Schneider. Yeah, appreciate and it. And thank you guys for watching another interview with The Neuroscientist. I've been Matt Taylor and uh, please, uh, like this uh, YouTube video and hit the subscribe button. Do so. All right. Cool. Take care. Yep. That was great. Awesome. Right. Cool.